All right, so we had some problems with the recording of this lecture, so I'm just going to record it as a screencast here. The topic is tools and shop processes. We're also going to talk about safety in here as well, since that's a really important thing, as this is a hands-on class, and you're actually going to be working with tools and equipment that are dangerous and could cause harm to you, or in the worst case, even death. I encourage you to go look on the course website. There's a lot of material there that we're not going to have time to cover, and there's a lot of really excellent videos. Some of them are long. For example, on the lathe, there are several very long videos because it's a very complex topic. And I guess if you're really interested in maybe how to run a lathe, that's something that you should spend time watching. But I encourage you, especially with the shorter videos or the ones on hand tools that you're going to commonly use to watch the entire thing. For example, the file section has a couple of videos that are marginally long, but turn out to be really useful. And then if you're going to use one of the tools that there's a section on, definitely watch the videos in that section and read that section before using it. I tried to be very careful about adding safety precautions that you need to take in there as well. And of course, if you see anything that's missing, do file it as an issue on GitHub or send us a message. So when you're working in the lab or in the shop, safety is the most important thing and should always be on your mind. As the sign here says, the machine has no brain, you have to use your own. And it can definitely get away from you pretty quickly because we are dealing with large things that have a lot of mass that are in some cases spinning very quickly, and they're sharp. So there's a lot of ways that you could get hurt, but as long as you are thinking about it and know the hazards, these machines are pretty safe to operate. The easiest thing to do is make sure you're always wearing appropriate clothing. For example, closed-toed shoes are required any time that we're in the lab or the shop. You cannot have open sandals or anything like that. It's better if you have steel toes even, because then if you drop something, maybe you won't have a, a serious injury from that. But you must wear closed-toed shoes. That includes when we go to the machine shop next class. Uh, also, wearing long dangling jewelry or loose clothing, long sleeves, baggy clothing, or having long hair that's down is dangerous because it could become quickly wrapped in anything that's spinning, especially because material is pretty fibrous and cutters like to grab onto that. So, for example, if you had a dangling sleeve or a tie or something on and we're operating a lathe or a mill, it could pretty easily pull you into the rotating part or into the cutter, and that would be a really bad day. So you want to make sure that you tie up hair, take off jewelry, and uh, roll up your sleeves if necessary. Another thing is try not to work alone, especially I know this is hard to do when we're all working in the lab late at night on something for your research, especially before an upcoming conference, let's say, but you should make sure that somebody knows that you're there working and about when you expect to be done. Because if you do get into a situation where you are trapped or something has fallen on you or you're disabled in some way, you could be there for a significant amount of time before somebody actually comes into the lab and finds you. So it's, make, it's just wise to make sure that somebody knows where you are or that somebody else is there and not uh, somebody that could get in the exact same situation with you so you're both stuck. Another thing, another piece of PPE or personal protective equipment is eyewear. Anytime that you're working in the lab or in the machine shop, you should have some kind of protective eyewear on. The kind of eyewear you need does vary by what you're doing. Uh, most commonly, safety glasses are enough for glasses with side shields. But in some cases, you might need goggles if there are things that could be coming in from the side or from the top. Or a combination of those and maybe even a face shield. This is particularly common if you're working with some kind of chemical that could splash and you need to guard your entire face. For other operations such as welding, things that we'll talk about later, you might even need safety glasses that have darkened lenses to protect your eyes from the bright light and from the UV exposure. Some of the processes that you do in the lab or in the shop can be pretty noisy especially when you're doing something like grinding. If you're grinding, say, a thin sheet metal plate, it can vibrate and just make an incredible amount of noise for such a small part. 
Your hearing is very easy to protect and very expensive and difficult to deal with the loss of, so you should wear earplugs. These foam earplugs are uh, the little collapsible earplugs on a string that you just compress and stick in your ear and let them expand are very cheap and widely available. They should be available from the safety uh, officer in your lab or in your shop, and you can buy huge packs of these on Amazon for not much money at all. There are some more permanent solutions as well, like the over-the-head earmuffs that you see people that are doing, for example, lawn work or construction work all day that are constantly operating heavy machinery wearing. Those are also good options, and they're really not that expensive, but for the for the lab or for the shop, I would say the compressible foam earplugs are the more common uh, type of hearing protection that you'll find in use. Another good item that if you don't have, you should go buy is a set of gloves. These are deerskin gloves. They are probably $15 at your uh, local home improvement store, and they can save you a lot of pain and grief. Uh, about a year ago as of recording this, I actually drilled partway into my hand because I didn't have any gloves on and it wasn't a very good uh, setup that I had. So gloves can become entangled in rotating equipment, so there is a little bit of a trade-off there. You have to think uh, wisely about whether you should be wearing gloves for a specific operation or not, but especially for small puncture wounds or cut wounds when you're working with something, uh, sharp tools or anything like that, they're really a good idea to have around and pretty cheap protection. Of course, there are also plastic gloves and lab gloves that work well for dealing with chemicals or things where you're just going to get absolutely filthy and you want to be able to rip them off and throw them in the trash and you're clean. If you have a part or a tool that is rotating, you never want to touch it even if it seems like it's rotating slowly. So here we've got a lathe and looks like we're turning down a piece of stock here. It's something we'll talk about here in a little bit, but you want to make sure that it is completely stopped before you touch any part of it. Even when it's rotating very slowly, there's a lot of inertia there, and the sharp edges can cut you, or if there's threads and you say, oh, you're just going to take a rag and stick it in those threads to clean them out while it's spinning down, it will very easily suck the rag in, and if the threads are appropriate size, the part will thread onto your finger and probably shear it off. So that is a really bad thing. Wait until the tool has stopped. There are cases where you'll use a file on a rotating part, or you'll lubricate a rotating part. Of course, you need to use extreme caution there because you don't want to get clothing or anything entangled in the rotating pieces, but you are using the appropriate technique. Uh, you're not trying to use a rag and clean something off. Also, one that a lot of people don't think about is grinders. Uh, they're in use very commonly in a lot of labs, but the grinding wheel itself is very, very brittle and can and probably will at some point explode. Each of those fragments can contain a pretty comparable amount of energy to a 9mm bullet, and if you're standing directly in front of the grinder using it when that wheel explodes, those pieces are going to hit you and the chest or in the face and cause some pretty significant damage. So you always want to stand slightly off to the side when you're using the tool to grind down anything at all. It's just a, a good common safety practice. Even though they do have those guards, there are still pieces that will make it out and to you. The biggest thing with safety is just thinking ahead because you need to be thinking two or three steps from where you are now about what you're going to do, and then be very attentive to the step that you're on. So you don't get yourself in a bad situation. You're thinking ahead about, I'm going to lift this heavy metal part and move it over here, and you can think of the hazards, the trap hazards, for example, for your hands while you're doing that, and make sure that you avoid those situations. Okay, so now we're going to shift and talk about fabrication methods, now that we've covered safety and talk about different ways that we can make parts that are going to be used in the lab and different ways that we can join them as well. So machining is the first one that we're going to talk about. Machining is a subtractive uh, process where you have a large piece of stock material and then you are removing some of that material to get the desired part. 
In the photo here, we've got a large CNC, or computer numeric control, milling machine. And an operator there is working on, you can see a very large piece of stock clamped down to the table there. And this machine has been removing, in this case, probably the, the mounting holes that you see in the large bore in the center. Also notice the operator is wearing some gloves because the edges on this part are likely sharp until they've been broken. So you want to make sure that you don't get cut. Um, these kind of machines are pretty common in university machine shops. Uh, maybe not quite to this scale, but computer and American control machines are getting to be commonplace. Uh, you can also use casting and molding to create parts. Uh, this is where you're taking some kind of form and then pouring molten metal or molten plastic in to create the part. On the bottom right there, you can see this little fitting that's got some internal passageways and threads that uh, is very easily cast and would be difficult and expensive and time-consuming to machine from a raw stock material. This is an example of casting aluminum. So there's a sand form there. It's a sand with a special uh, compound that makes it very cohesive. And it was formed around a pattern, and then the pattern was removed. And you can see here, there's metal being poured in and it's allowed to cool. This is something that you can do, and this is actually being done in somebody's home shop. So it's something that's not impossible to do, though I would not say I've seen many labs that do this themselves. But it's really good for creating complex parts that would be difficult to machine out of a solid piece of material. Now, they're not going to be precision. The metal does shrink, and so what you generally do is make areas that are not precision, you just make them in the casting, and then you'll have a little bit of extra material in areas that need to be some precise dimension or very flat, and then you'll machine those portions of the casting later. So in this case, maybe that section on the bottom that you can see exposed is going to be machined flat, along with a few other bosses, they're called, that are sticking out there. And so after the casting comes out of the mold, you can see you're just breaking the sand away here, and then if you're going to make multiple of these, you would have to, of course, rebuild the mold and then do it again. The most common thing that you're familiar with is probably cast plastic parts or injection molded parts. On the top left there, you can see what a mold might look like. These are made out of steel or aluminum. You can get many, many, many parts out of a mold before it wears out. Uh, aluminum maybe a little bit less so than steel. But the molds are very expensive to make. We're talking something like $5,000 up to have a mold made. But then each of the parts that comes out is very cheap. It can be manufactured very, very quickly. On the right there, you see something that might be ejected from a mold. We have four parts in this case that are joined together. The gate is where the plastic enters the cavity for the part. And there's a runner that distributes the plastic into the, each of the gates, and then a sprue where the plastic was injected from the machine into the mold. At the bottom there, you can see what a molding machine might typically look like. That's a pretty small and basic one. But these have to take plastic pellets, melt them down, inject them at high pressure into a mold with two halves that is held together at high pressure. The mold's cooled, the mold opens, the parts ejected, and the process is repeated. This can happen at a variety of speeds and complexities of the mold, but there are a lot of design constraints, like you need to have consistent wall thickness, and you need to have slight tapers so that parts eject out of the mold efficiently. So there are a lot of things to think about, but if you need to make a lot of something, say uh, you're going to make your own some kind of special container for your experiment, and they were disposable after each experiment you needed a new one, then it might make sense to have a mold made so that you could have thousands of these containers made very cheaply as compared to machining or casting each one out of whatever material you needed. Uh, doing this injection molding would probably be the way to go. This is a video of an injection molding machine working. I will say this is not an incredibly fast machine uh, compared to some of the others that I've seen, especially from this company. But you can see here they're making some kind of little plastic cup or container. It looks like maybe for pudding or applesauce or ice cream, something like that. And then so the mold closes, plastic's injected, it cools, it opens, there's a container, the robot arm pulls them off, 
and then it does it over and over again. This is how things like uh, your plastic water bottles, and this company also makes a machine that does the plastic water bottle caps, and it makes something like 75 of those every mold cycle, and it cycles the mold every second or two. So this is a much larger, more complicated machine than the one on the previous slide. Another actually pretty common way for consumer goods and laboratory goods is sheet metal work. Sheet metal is relatively cheap. You can buy it in very large uh, of different materials, but steel being one of the more common. And then you punch out uh, with hydraulic presses holes and patterns into it, and then you can fold it using what's called a break into complex shapes. There are also roller folding systems like that shown in the upper left, but you can make on the top right there that kind of a bracket very, very cheaply and very quickly using a punch and break method. Now, breaks come in all kinds of sizes, as do punches. There are ones that are desktop size that you can buy at somewhere like Harbor Freight Tools for 100 bucks or so. There are some bigger ones that would sit on their own stand that you could buy for several hundred dollars. And then, of course, there are hydraulic ones that are huge, like the one pictured here, uh, that that little stand sitting by it with the button is supposed to be about waist height on the operator. We'll see an example of that here in a second. These come in a variety of complexities. There are simple hand-operated ones where you line everything up manually, uh, or there are computer numeric control ones where it actually directs you in each stage of forming the bracket, and it puts the stops in the right place. But this is a pretty cheap way to do things like making closures, so boxes for your equipment uh, or front panels for your equipment. It's a relatively efficient way to do it. Now here's a video of a bracket being made. These are called the fingers on the brake that are going down and pushing and bending the metal. You can see it's making a bend, the parts are moved, and then those backstops move according to the program so that the piece of metal just has to be set in until it touches those, and then the machine can be actuated again. In this case, making a relatively complex part for not much time or money at all. And this is something that a lot of university and research, research shops will have the capability to do. As another example, this is making car doors. There's a big roll of steel. It's going through this machine being cut to size. And this is much slower than the production process in terms of the press forming that we're going to see here, but it was done to show the point for the recording of this video. The piece of steel is put in this uh, press. The press closes, and just like that, you have two formed car doors into the steel that can then be cut apart and used. So you can make pretty complex shapes this way as well. Here it is again. The press closes and there's the door. You can also do punching operations with this. Welding is something that we're not going to talk much about except for spot welding. It is a very useful fabrication technique, but there are many types of welding. Each has advantages and disadvantages for different types of metals and types of joints. It's something that you should talk to your shop about, and it's generally something that requires a lot of experience and training, so it's something that you might not be doing directly. Uh, it's generally easier to get somebody who's an experienced welder to construct your equipment for you because you need to be able to rely on that joint. And if you're just learning, you don't want to do a mission-critical high-stress joint when you're just trying to figure out how to weld. On the upper left there is what's called a MIG welder, which actually feeds wire and a cloud of inert gas out around the tip. And then there's a very strong electrical current that passes. It melts the metal. Uh, surrounding where the tip is, and it feeds that wire in as filler, it makes a very strong joint. A type of welding that's very commonly used in research is TIG welding, mostly because we make a lot of our equipment out of aluminum. In this case, you have a torch, and it's tungsten inert gas, that's what TIG stands for, that you're using to strike an arc and heat the material and actually melt it, and then you dip a filler rod in to create the joint. Another common type of welding shown on the bottom left is stick welding or arc welding, 
where you have a consumable electrode that you feed into the joint as filler and the electrical arc melts the material. That does require a little bit more cleanup than some of the other types of welding, but it's pretty cheap to do. On the bottom right, you can see a cutting torch, which could also be used with a different head to do brazing, a slightly different operation. In this case, you are melting or oxidizing the steel and cutting through a very thick railroad beam here. The type of welding that we will talk about, spot welding, as shown in the upper right. That's a pretty large spot welder, but there are many varieties of them, and this is safe to do in the laboratory and doesn't actually require too much training. Unlike the others that are shooting sparks everywhere and there's lots of hot metal flying around, we have to have a dedicated area to do it, spot welding is used for thin pieces of sheet metal and can be done almost anywhere. So here's a video example. He's making some kind of a bracket so he wants to weld those two pieces of material together, clamps them, opens up the jaws of the spot welder, positions it, and then hits the switch. And you see that there is a current flowing between those two electrodes, and the resistance of the material is heating it and causing that weld to be formed. Now that weld should be as strong as the material or stronger. So if you pull those pieces of material, they should actually break the material, not the weld. This doesn't work on very thermally conductive or electrically conductive materials. So things like copper don't spot weld well, but steel, those types of materials are very easy to spot weld. And these types of welders can be picked up relatively cheaply at uh, different supply houses. Another technique is printing. Uh, other than, I mean, there, 3D printing is included in this, but there are other types of printers. And it's a very quick way to create prototypes, sometimes final products, but it's not as new as people might think. For example, 3D printing has been around for quite some time. On the left there is a Lulzbot Taz, one of the more recent and up-to-date 3D printers. You can see it's printed a little octopus down there on the build plate. And this type of printer takes a plastic filament that's about three millimeters in diameter in, heats it and squirts it out of that print head, and then builds the part layer by layer. And you can adjust how fast and how thick each layer is. Uh, it controls the surface finish of the part and also the print time. So small prints might take a few minutes, large prints could take days to do. There are other types of 3D printers. Uh, there are some that have a resin that is cured by light and so they will shine a light pattern and then lift the resin with some of it now hardened slightly up shine another light pattern and they build a part up layer by layer that way there's commercial surfaces like shapeways that have tons of different 3d printers of different techniques they can do things like have a bed of nylon or of titanium or other metals and use lasers to center it together and then deposit a new bed of particles and do it again and build a part up out of metal or other materials that way. And really it's a good thing to use services like that because it is expensive to maintain your own equipment unless you really need it for rapid iteration and in that case something like the TAS is probably adequate. There are also laser cutters like that shown in the top right that of course just do 2D but they're very easy to cut parts out of wood, plastic, leather, that kind of thing, and make very precise parts. And then there are water jets shown in the bottom right. That's a five-axis machine. That's a pretty fancy water jet. They use high-pressure water with garnet abrasive in the stream to cut straight through pretty big sections of metal. So we'll see each of these in action. This is a 3D printer building up some brackets. You can see there's a number of them here. This is, of course, a time lapse. This process took a couple hours, most likely. And just layer by layer, each of these parts is built up. You'll see there's some risers that are being printed that go very quickly. And there are the finished parts sitting on the print bed ready for you to peel off and use. There are different types of plastic you can use here, uh, ABS and PLA being some of the more common. This is a video showing a 
commercially available laser cutter. In this case, taking a design, you can cut this to uh, tens of microns precision generally, and just cutting right through the material. You can make, even though they're just 2D parts, you can make parts that interlock or stack to give you some complex 3D structures. In this case, it looks like a world uh, where you're using uh, a light bulb inside and the corrugations and the cardboard to let the light out. This one is really neat. This is a water jet, and a lot of water jets are just two-axis machines. They move the head in X and Y. This is a five-axis machine, so it can make some pretty complex shapes, and these can cut through very thick plates. I'll go ahead and start the video here. But these were used to do things like construct the Alvin submersible by cutting through steel plates that were a couple of inches thick, something that's very hard to do in any other way. And they can do this with a precision of a few thousandths of an inch. So here you can see this is a pretty thick plate. And as we're cutting, the water jet is pivoting because it's a five axis machine and it's cutting at an angle through the plate. These are relatively expensive machines, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they can be expensive to operate because they are going to be using a lot of garnet abrasive, and that abrasive is only used once. It passes through the water jet and through the part, and then it settles in the bottom of the tank and is not used again. So there can be significant costs to operating these, but when you need one, you really need one because it would be very hard to get this part that you're seeing be made, uh, made in any other way out of one piece of material and to be as precise as this is going to be. A lot of university shops are getting to where they have these. They are incredibly useful if you have access to one. And there are commercial services like eMachine Shop. Here you see the part comes out and it's this complex turbine looking shape with the blades cut out of one solid piece of material by the water jet. So some more traditional machining tools. The lathe is, I would say, one of the most widely used tools. And I have been told that it is the only machine tool that can completely make itself. The lathe is used to turn cylindrical sections of parts. So you have a chuck over there towards the left side of the machine that holds the part and will rotate. It is driven by the headstock, which is a motor and gearbox, and it's got a lot of selectors for feeds and speeds there. The tool is held by the tool post on the, there's a compound rest that, and a cross slide. So the cross slide lets you feed the tool in and out across the radial dimension of the part. And the cross slide can be used to feed it at an angle. And then the apron travels up and down the bed and kind of the, the y or the x axis as you're looking at the tool. And it can be moved by hand or it can be engaged onto a lead screw or a feed rod to be moved at a precise rate to do things like cut threads. And so that's all part of the, the carriage assembly that moves. The ways are the uh, surfaces on which the carriage moves. They need to be taken very good care of and kept clean, and uh, they affect the accuracy of the machine greatly. Then there's the tailstock, which you can see it slides up and down the ways as well. And you can mount things like a dead center to support a long part. You can imagine if you're trying to spin a long part, it would be flopping around. You don't want that. Or you can put a drill chuck in it and actually put drills, taps, that kind of thing in there and use them to drill or tap precisely in the center of the part. This is a very useful machine, and small ones can be had for $1,000 or so and would be useful to have in the laboratory though commonly much larger machines are available. And some universities have these available to students to use as well. This is a video of a computer-controlled lathe. And we'll see it do several operations here. First, we've got the skin spinning part. The tool comes in, and we call this facing. We're making a flat surface on the end of the part. And then we will turn the part, which means we're reducing its diameter.
And this is done generally in a roughing pass, and then you go back and take a finer pass to get a very good finish once you get to the diameter that you want. You can see there are a lot of metal chips flying around, so if this was a machine that you were operating manually, you want to make sure that you have some, some safety guards in place and that you're taking your eyewear precautions. Here it changed tools, and now it's using a tool to cut some grooves. So we're further necking down part of this part. There would be several ways to do this, but this is a relatively efficient way to. You could also use this tool to cut off the part, or what an operation that would be called parting. And then here there's that fine pass to remove those tool marks from each individual cut in and give a nice finish. Notice we're coming in from the ends. A little bit of a problem with chip buildup here. Taking another cut for another groove. With these tools, you're generally concerned about what the surface speed at the tool is. So the larger the part, the slower you have to spin it to get the same surface speed at the tool. It's something that you can look up tables for in machinist's handbooks, and something that you also get a feel for as you begin to work with the tool more. So here we're taking those nice passes to get good finish. Then we're going to go over and change tools again time to a very fine grooving tool. It's going to come in and cut some small grooves. And notice this is a pretty quick process really to make this part, something that would be very hard to do in any other way. And even doing this on a manual machine uh, wouldn't be that much of a chore. And there you go, there is a finished part. The milling machine is, I would say, maybe the second most commonly used tool. A uh, drill press would be similar, but a milling machine is a lot more capable, so if you are able to use one of those, you're set. In this case, you've got a motor up top on this milling machine head, and it's kind of the opposite of a lathe. You're holding the part stationary, and you're spinning the tool instead of holding the tool stationary and spinning the part. There are a lot of different tools. This is a vertical milling machine or a turret head milling machine. It's the most common. There are horizontal mills. But you've got a table that you can move very precisely in X, Y, and Z to move the part around the tool and remove material. The knee of the machine goes up and down to elevate the table, and then you can move it in and out and side to side. There are a lot of different things you can do with this machine. There are CNC ones that can do very complicated procedures, but they're very worthwhile to have if possible because they let you do things like drill precise hole patterns, Using a rotary table, you can mill grooves for something like an O-ring in an oddly shaped part that would be hard to do in a lathe. This is an example of a CNC mill. This is using a shear hog to go in and remove a bunch of material from the center of this part. This is something that would be pretty hard to do without a rotary table on a manual machine but the computer makes it pretty easy. They are coming in with a smaller end mill that can cut on the end and sides. Notice the coolant spraying. Coolant is a very important part of machining. It keeps the bit and the part cool and lubricated so that the tool does not overheat and become dull. It's got a long life and the part doesn't get too hot and you have some weird thermal expansion and warping effects. So I'm going to fast forward this video a little bit so you can see here we're getting some complex internal structure going. 
and now it's going through and doing some cleanup. You can see we have these really complicated parts sticking up inside that there's no way to get it that precise other than even if you cast it, they wouldn't have such nice faces on them. EDM, uh, or uh, electric discharge machining, is another way to make very, very accurate parts. In this case, you're just using sparks to actually remove material and create cuts that are much smoother and more accurate than you can do with a mill or a lathe. There are two types of EDM. On the left, you see a wire EDM machine where wire is passed through the system. It's only used once, and it cuts out the metal around it. You can see it was used there to cut a gear. And then there is plunge EDM, where you have a tool that is shaped like the indentation or the part that you want to make, and it is plunged in, and the material is removed in that shape. It's normally made out of some kind of conductive material, a graphite-based uh, part would be a good, our graphite-based tool would be a good one. This is very expensive to do. The machines are very expensive, and a lot of shops don't have them. Some university machine shops do, but the shops that have them want to keep them running continuously to pay for themselves and pay for the operators, so they're very likely to take on one-off parts for something like your lab project. This is a video of an EDM working. You can see it's a pretty big machine with a pretty big control cabinet. In this case, it looks like we're cutting another gear. You can see the electrical arc, and there's a flood of coolant or dielectric that's flowing there. It's a relatively slow process, but the kerf or the width of the cut is very well known. You can see the wire feeder there. And it's very easy to account for, so you can get incredibly precise parts made from this uh, relatively quickly as well. And there you see the coordinates of the machine, of course, all under computer control. And there's a last look at the part being cut. You can see it's a pretty thick piece of material as well. The material that you're going to make your part out of makes a lot of difference in terms of cost and performance of the part. And there was some reading on this in the assigned reading from the first week. But So we're not going to go over it too much here, but generally aluminum is a good choice for a lot of laboratory uh, fixtures and jigs that aren't necessarily going to be under that much stress. Steel is another common choice. Uh, brass and bronze are definitely used in a lot of laboratory equipment. There are some precautions that you have to take when machining them because they do tend to grab onto tools. And there are some special tools that you have to use. And there are some really weird materials like beryllium copper that we use for load cells in our laboratory, but they are hard to machine and they're actually hazardous to machine. So they can be very expensive to deal with. You need to make sure that you're using the right material. It has the right mechanical properties, electrical properties, thermal properties, and so on. But you need to look up exactly what it's going to mean to have to make a part out of that. Uh, fasteners, there's a lot of information on the website about fasteners that hold parts together into assemblies. I'm not going to go over them in great detail here, other than to say go look on the website. There's all you could want to know about fasteners on there. And I'm sure that somebody's going to come up with more to add, which is great. But it's everything as basic as zip ties to, uh, on the bottom left there, you see what we would call a cotter key. The rest of the world would call a, a split key that goes through a hole in a shaft and retains parts. Next to it on the right is a split pin that is driven into a hole. You can see that there has a split in it, and you would compress it slightly when you drive it in, hence the chamfers on the end. And the spring action will hold it in. It's a self-retaining fastener. You can see another type of key there on the bottom right. Above it are some rivets. These are pop rivets. We use a pop rivet tool to put them through a hole and a couple pieces of sheet metal. And the back side is uh, deformed and then it holds the pieces of metal together. These are commonly used in bridges, airplanes, ships, 
uh, a lot of construction type applications and in construction of laboratory equipment. They're a pretty cheap and efficient way. And you can drill them off to remove the fastener. In the center are clips, retaining clips. These can be internal or external uh, to grooves on a shaft or in a housing. They go by a number of names, circ clips, e-clips, retaining rings. Each of them may be a little bit different for the particular uh, use, but I do have information on that on the website once again. And at the top, there are what some people consider screws, and then on the right, a nut and bolt. The actual definition of the difference between a screw and a bolt is pretty undefined. There is a U.S. Customs and Border Protection document on it that I did link on the website in case you're really curious. But, I mean, small bolts are called machine screws. That kind of rules out the idea that, well, maybe screws have a point and tap themselves into material. But you get the idea that screws and nuts and bolts are used to hold many assemblies together. And, of course, they have threads. Threads are a, a wrapped inclined plane that we use to exert force to hold these parts together or apart. And this is not the best image, but unfortunately it had all the things on it that I wanted to show. But you can see the major and minor diameters of the threads. The bottom of the thread is called the root, and the top is called the crest. And if there is a thread angle, uh, normally 60 degrees, uh, that makes that kind of triangle shape there. And the pitch is the distance between two consecutive thread crests. And so in the U.S., we have a number system, like a number four screw or number four thread. And then it's followed by the number of threads per inch. So a 440 machine screw is a number four size, and it has 40 threads per inch. In the metric system you would have something like an M12 by one and a half. M12 being the major diameter of the thread, 12 millimeters, and then the one and a half being the pitch, so a 1.5 millimeter distance between each thread. And there are a lot of different kinds of threads. These are just a few. You can see some have slightly different shapes on the top. Some of them are not triangular at all. Some of them are asymmetric, which causes all kinds of funny things to happen but they each have a really good use. You can consult something like the Machinist Handbook to learn about these and which one is what you should be using for your particular application. There are lots of variations on these. There are threads that have multiple starts, like the thing on your toothpaste, so you don't have to keep rotating the cap to find when it can go on. It probably has two or four starts. If you look at it when you brush your teeth next, you'll be able to tell. And I think those are commonly Acme threads or stub Acme threads. Acme threads are also used on a lot of big high-stress applications. We use those on our rock deformation apparatus, for example. But there are buttress threads and all kinds of special ones. The most common that you're going to see are the unified threads up there in the top center, at least in the U.S. We have the UNC, the Unified National Course, and the UNF, the Unified National Fine thread gauges. This is a table. Uh, I've handed out a version of this uh, for all of you to have that has some of the most common screw sizes and their nearest fractional and decimal thread diameters. So now we're going to do an activity. Uh, I'm going to hand out a number of things, common items, everything from staplers and can openers to uh, a razor knife and some other maybe a little bit less common items, uh, some custom items here. And I want you to look at them and try to figure out what technique was used to create that part and why that technique was probably used. Uh, generally, it's because it's something that's going to be cost-effective or fast or strong. And what kind of fasteners are used to assemble the different parts if there are fasteners, and why were those chosen? Uh, maybe they could have used a rivet instead of a screw, but there's probably a reason that they didn't. And also, what's the part made of? It's made out of steel or aluminum or plastic, and why do you think that is? Also, for the next class, go to the threading activity that's under the lab exercises part of the webpage. There's a video at the bottom of that. Go ahead and watch that. It's just about four or five minutes long. It'll prepare you for the activity that we're going to do next time. Next, 
week, remember to wear shop-appropriate clothing. We're going to go to the machine shop, so you have to have closed-toe shoes. And then we're going to go up into the lab and do the threading activity after we get back from the machine shop. So once again, make sure that you've got something that you can tie long hair up with, remove your jewelry, all of that. And until then, we will see you next week when we go to the machine shop. Thanks.